when my kids were younger, me and Angie took them on a trip to Branson. And we loaded up in the car and we headed west through Arkansas. And we knew somewhere along the way the, the GPS would tell us to turn right and we'd go north and we'd hit Missouri. But back in those days, you know, GPSs weren't on our phone and they weren't as nice as they are today. I don't know, something along the way happened and the sound got turned down on the GPS. And when we realized it, we cut it back on and it was saying, turn around, turn around, turn around. I don't, it probably wasn't saying that, but I, that's the way I remember it. It was saying, you got to go back. And we realized we had went 20 miles past our turnoff. You know, there's a big road that leads straight in into Missouri's four lane the whole way. So we're 20 miles past and this thing is saying, turn around, turn around. But I'm thinking, man, we don't want, I'm not going 20 miles back. I mean, we'll find another road. Angie's saying, turn around, turn around. <laughs> and I'm like, no, we'll find something else. And we cut the GPS off and made it come back on and said, get us there from here, you know. And it finally relented and said, okay, turn right here, you know. The thing is, told us to turn down this two-lane highway. And we, it looked kind of suspicious. And we're like, would this go all the way to Missouri? Well, surely the GPS, you know, wouldn't lead us astray. So we took that road. And I'm not kidding you. I don't know where we were, but we must have went around every mountain on the way. Uh, every mountain in Arkansas. I mean, two lane the whole way. Angie's over there about to throw up because she gets car sick. And, and the kids are like, we ever going? You know, they used to say, how, how far is it, Daddy? Or are we there yet? Right? They just gave up on saying that, or they're saying, are we going to survive this? Right. You know, it was the longest trip. It took about like three hours longer than it would have if I'd have went back those 20, hour, 20 miles. <laughs> we rolled up into Branson, Missouri, and turned off at this little roach motel that Angie had booked us. We were wore out. The kids had had fought and screamed, and they were wore out. And I, did, did I mention I was sick? Before we even left, I was feeling bad. Angie was feeling bad from driving around those mountains. And we went into this Roach Motel. Angie said she got it for free because we were supposed to go to a timeshare presentation for it. I didn't know what that was. But I, all I know was I got in there and I said, I'm taking a nap. I feel terrible. And I laid down on that bed and I laid on the side of it. And all of a sudden, I just rolled down into the middle. It was just, the bed was like this. But I fell asleep. I woke up the next morning. Not only was I still sick, my back was hurting. Everybody was, didn't get a night's sleep. And I said, well, at least we're on vacation. And Angie said, yep, we got to be at the timeshare in 30 minutes. That timeshare presentation lasted three hours. Oh, Lord. Sometimes you just got to turn it around. Sometimes when the GPS, when God's positioning system says turn it around, you turn it around. We've been singing about God turning it around. That's what we're going to talk about today. Do you, do you believe God can turn it around? I'll be honest. The rest of the vacation, we went to that timeshare thing. and The rest of the vacation turned out okay. You know, God turned it around. God works with what you give him to work with. If you're on the wrong road, then you ain't giving him much to work with, are you? But if you get back on the right road and you turn it around, he'll turn it around. God is a God of the tur turnaround. Think about when Jesus was here. All the blind people that he gave sight to. They were walking around in, in utter darkness. And he opened their eyes. And they saw the world. That's a big turnaround. When Jesus walked, he saw lepers and he had compassion on them. He healed them. Do you know the lepers, they could feel no human compassion. Nobody could touch them. They were quarantined. They couldn't even be with their family. It was like the worst existence ever, sitting there scratching yourself, limbs falling off. It was horrible existence. And Jesus said, be clean. 
and their skin turned soft as a baby's. That's a turnaround. Jesus was in the turnaround business. I think about the demoniac in the tomb. This guy howled at the moon for a living. I mean, he ran around naked in the graveyard, howling at the moon, cutting himself with sharp rocks, filled with a legion of demons. That's no existence. But Jesus came across that sea. And just in a few minutes, the man was free. Just in a few minutes, he turned it around. The townsfolk came to see what happened, and he was sitting in his right mind, clothed at Jesus' feet. He wanted to go with Jesus back on the boat, but Jesus said, I got an assignment for you. I need you to be a missionary. Go back to the ten towns you came from and show everybody what I did for you. One day he's howling at the moon, the next day he's preaching for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a turnaround. And some of us can look back at our life and say, you know, one day I was selling drugs. One day I was doing this. One day I was howling at the moon, so to speak. And now look at me. God's using me. God's turned it around. I think about Lazarus. What a, what a turnaround. This man's been in the tomb for four days, dead as a skunk. Stinking like one. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out alive. That's a turnaround. Does anybody doubt that our God is a God of turnaround? I think about Peter. He denied Jesus three times and said, I don't even know the man. The last time he did it with a curse. Cursing to prove that he don't know this Jesus. Scared for his own life. He didn't realize that he had denied the Lord. He went and wept bitterly. He cried till he had no more tears. The next day he gets up and he goes back to his old boat that he had given up for Jesus. He goes, so I just I go a fishing. I done messed up my Christianity. How many of y'all feel like have felt like that you have messed up your Christianity? You have denied Jesus. You have did not did what he wanted you to do. You went back to the thing he told you to he freed you from. And you feel like, I have denied Christ. I might as well just go back to my old life. He can't use me now. And so he gets out on the boat. But then he sees Jesus hunting him down to turn it around. And Jesus turned it around. He turned it around. And Peter became part of the rock of this church in which we stand here today. The woman with the issue of blood. She looked to the world. That's where we often look first, isn't it? That's where most of us look. Oh, my answer is in science. My answer is the doctor. My answer is this. So surely somebody can help me turn it around. She spent all the money she had trying to turn it around. She had an issue of flowing blood. She couldn't stop. She was anemic. She was about to die probably. This has been going on for years. It says she spent all the money that she had. She put all her trust in the doctors. And it says she only grew worse. And out of desperation, she hears that Jesus is coming through town. And though she, can, she can't even see him for the mass of people following him, she, she bumps and claws and crawls her way through that just to touch the hem of his garment. And when she touches it, he turned it all around with a touch. Just the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. The hem of his robe. And he felt the power leave him. She turned to Jesus. And he turned it around. What, what did all these people have in common? They turned to Jesus. We sing God turn it around. But he says, you first. You say, Pastor, last week you talked about the time is now. We thought you was going to come in here with a riveting message and show us what we're supposed to do. I am. I'm telling you exactly what we got to do. We got to get on the right road before we, before we get this thing going. 
we got to get back face to face with Jesus. We don't just take off on our own say, the time is now and I'm going to do what I want. No, we need to turn this thing around. And that's what the time is now. That's where you start. You get your eyes back on Jesus. I'm telling you, we better get our eyes back on Jesus. All I talked about last week was the time is now, the time in which we live. And people just, they're getting caught up. Where did all the people go in this section? And we're saying, well, it ain't going to happen to me. I've got my life under control. You better guard yourself. Some, of, some people that have been my most trusted warriors for years are fading. And I'm pleading with you because I love you. Check yourself so the devil don't wreck yourself. Acts 20, 21. Paul says, I had one message for Jews and Greeks alike. Are you a Jew? Then you're a Greek. You're either one or the other. That includes everybody. He said, I got one message for everybody. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God. Say, turning to God. That's what we're preaching about today. Of turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. That's how you get saved. You repent from your sins. You turn from the sin. You turn to Jesus and have faith in Him and you get saved. Now how are we going to finish this race strong? How are we going to finish in faith? We're going to have to stay turned to Jesus. We can't let the world turn us around. We can't let the world turn us upside down. We got to keep our eyes on the prize. We got to listen to the GPS. God positioning system. Are you where God wants you to be right now? Will you say, I'm in the vicinity. I'm just maybe 20 miles down the road. I'm sure if I turn when I have to, I'll get back on track. Is that right? Are you prepared for that secondary road? Or do you want God's best? <laughs> God will make those crooked roads straight. Even if you have to sleep on a sunken mattress, he'll give you sleep, sweet sleep. <laughs> when he, when we turn, he turns. There's a coming together. There's a responsibility on both sides. When we turn to God, He turns our sin into salvation. When we turn to God, He turns our sorrow into joy. He turns our bondage into freedom. He turns our po poverty into prosperity. Has He done it for you? He has done all those things for me. He turns our sickness into health. He turns our loneliness into fellowship and family. God turns it around. That's what he does. But he's looking for repentance. He's looking for repentance in our heart. Because he can't do these things for you if you've got your back turned to him. Repentance means to turn from one thing and turn to him. It's not just a churchy word we use to scare the ungodly. It's a word for us today. And if you had to break it down to its essence, it means turn. It means to turn. Not just saying you're sorry or acknowledging your mistake and just presuming on the grace of God all the time but a heartfelt change of direction. 
It's not a churchy word. It's not a bad word. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to repent. It is a privilege that He will always forgive you when you confess your sins. That He will always be there when you turn to Him. It is a privilege to be able to turn to Him. It's a privilege. Isaiah 45, 22, God says, turn to me and be saved. Not just given eternal life, but saved in, in the fullness of the measure of that word. Whatever you need saving from. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. You don't need to turn to the world. You don't need, there's nobody, you don't need to call your friend for your, to be your answer. You need to turn to Him. So what do you need turning around in your life? Chad already asked you that. When we was ministering on the platform, he said, I want you to think about what you need God to turn around. What is it that you need from God? Do you have out of control debt in your life? Your credit card's maxed out? God can turn it around. God can turn it around. I've seen it done. Do you have weight issues? You fluctuate or you don't fluctuate? Do you wish you was this weight? Do you wish you was more healthy? You've tried this and tried that. And you've, you've called everybody in your phone book. To every, you've got 27 diet books on your shelf. What if you turn to God? Maybe you've got a health crisis. Maybe something's plaguing you. Maybe, maybe your marriage has lost its spark. Maybe you're just running on fumes. God can turn it around. He can turn it around. But you've got to turn to Him. You've got to do what He says do. Maybe you're single in here and you said, I... I need a spouse. God can turn it around. Somebody said, woo -hoo. Somebody said, oh, no. <laughs> God will work with you where you're at. You say, God, keep them men from me. I don't want none of them. <laughs> He'll do that too. What about your relationship with your kids? Is it running on life support? You... They don't call you anymore, or there's, there's tension there. You just can't seem to get past it. God will turn it around. It may not be overnight, but God will turn it around. Maybe you're just going through the motions in life. You're not fulfilled. You say, man, I thought my Christianity was going to make life glorious. I wouldn't have problems anymore. I thought life was just going to be grand. And I used to, I used to serve in the church. I used to do all these things. I, I led people to the Lord at one time. But now I'm just going through the motions. Isn't that what he talked to the church? And what was it? Smyrna maybe? In the book of Revelations? He said return to your first love. It was Laodicea. Turn to your first love. Return to me. I'll turn it around. I'll make life exciting again. I know when I first got saved, man, I couldn't wait to, for my feet to hit the floor because I had so much I got to do for Jesus. I get to do for Jesus. And now some of us are running from obligations. I don't want to serve anymore. I've had my time. Let somebody else do it. That's not the way I want to go out. It's not the way I want to go out. A great woman of God once said, if you don't know what to do, do what needs doing. And that great woman of God is Angie Sheffield. And she's back there running the overheads today. Because nobody else will do it. 
we got departments that are about to just, we just don't close them down if we don't have anybody to do it. I'm not saying, that's okay. That's okay. As for me and my house, we're going to keep serving the Lord. We're going to take your blessing if you don't take it. I remember Soul Food used to, used to move equipment all the time. We'd play all these gigs, Friday and Saturday, moving, moving equipment, heavy equipment, trailer full of equipment, you know. And there'd be times where certain people wasn't pulling their weight, you know. And I'd get so frustrated because I'm just a go-getter, and I always just jump in there, you know. And I'd get mad at people that wasn't doing it. And so one time I had a meeting, you know me. I had a meeting. I said, guys, I tell you what, I'm not going to argue with y'all anymore about who's moving what and who ain't doing their share or whatever. I'm just going to jump in there and do it all if I have to, and, I'm, and God's going to bless me, and I'm going to get y'all's blessing. I tell you, that was, I, I didn't have to say a thing anymore after that. <laughs> they was fighting to see who can carry the most equipment. <laughs> they didn't want me to get their blessing. I believe better things for us. I believe God can turn it around. I mean, who else are we going to turn to? We used to turn to ourselves. How'd that work out? Who are we going to turn to? The government? Oh, Lord. Turn to God. Draw nigh to Him. And he will draw nigh to you. There's a lady named Charlotte Gamble. She said, it's only when we start to act on what we say amen to. Let me say that again. Because it's hard to understand. It's only when we begin to act or to respond on the things. Amen, pastor. Amen. But it's when we respond and we begin to act on the things we say amen to that we begin to discover how certain we are of God's turnaround ability. You see, there's our part, and there's God's part. He says, we say, God, turn it around. He says, you first. And yes, sometimes in all of our lives, there's not a person in here that has not sinned after they've been saved, you holy people. There's, there's yes, repentance of your sin is, the right, is always the right course of action. If you have been unfaithful to God in any way, you feel uh, convicted by the Holy Spirit about anything, then repentance and faith towards God is always the right course of action. We think about uh, David, King David, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Terrible act. Something you would not expect from a man of God like David. But he got caught up in... You know, the emotions, the hormones, right? Got caught up in the moment, committed a sin. And then David decides he's going to hide his sin from God and act like it didn't happen. In fact, he's going to begin to try to cover up his sin himself. And so he ends up committing a worse sin, trying to cover up his previous sin. He commits murder to cover up his adultery. That's not something you would expect out of David, is it? But I have learned to see that we're all human. And people that do things that I just cannot conceive of. And you know why I know that's true? Because I do things I cannot conceive of myself doing. And then in Psalms chapter 32, verse 3. David writing this psalm, talking about that whole episode with Bathsheba and the whole thing about killing her husband to cover it up. He said, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Well, that's how I want to live. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy upon me. Thank the Lord for his discipline, for, for it brings us back to him. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Sin is a heavy weight. The guilt of sin is not worth bearing. 
when we have the privilege of repentance in our life. In verse 5, he said, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And guess what? You forgave me and all my guilt is gone. Now I don't have to waste away and groan all night long. Now I can have that peace, that good conscience again. And that's got where God wants you. And that's where you need to be. I'm telling you, if we, we, we valued a clear conscience like we ought to, we'd be the most repentant people in the world. We would continually turn back to God, turn back to Him, and experience that grace and that mercy every day. Every day. But what, what we do is we become hypocrites. And a hypocrite means like a play actor. And we play like everything is fine. I'm good. I, no, I don't, nobody knows what I did. So I'm good, right? I, maybe I can even go to church and make my, soothe my conscience and feel like I'm, you know, I'm okay. Because on the outside, I've washed the outside of the cup, right? Nobody knows. But on the inside, I'm like dead man's bones. On the inside, I'm wasting away and my strength is dried up like, like the dew on a summer day. No, that's not the way to go. That's not the way to go. Pretending to be holy is not holy. What did Pastor Vicker say? Take off the mask. If you got us fooled, fine. But you hadn't got your conscience fooled. And you certainly hadn't got God fooled. God sent Jonah to preach to a wicked town called Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah's like, man, that's the worst sinners ever. I'm not going down there. I don't even want them to be saved. That's a bad attitude for a Christian, isn't it? You see what God has to work with sometimes? <laughs> so Jonah gets on a boat going the opposite way. So God brings a big storm. <laughs> Which one of us is going to fight against God? It didn't take long for them guys to figure out who was causing the storm, and they chunked Jonah overboard. A big fish swallowed him up and spit him out on the shore. And he got up and he said, what do I do now? And God said, go to Nineveh. <laughs> Same thing. Sometimes you, even if you went 20 miles past your road, you still got to turn around and go back to that road. So Jonah goes to Nineveh with a bad attitude. He don't want to preach to these folks. He don't care about them. He don't want them saved. So reluctantly, just out of, for his own well-being, he tells them to repent. Probably the worst message ever. He probably said it in the nasty, unsanctified, unholy, unloving ways. You nasty people, repent. I don't care about you, but apparently God does. You know, that's probably his message. But you know what they did? The whole town repented. That's how good the message of repentance is. That no matter how bad I botch it, it's still good. It is still a good message. And then Jesus came and he told the story about Jonah and he said a greater than Jonah is here. Nineveh, that wicked city, they repented at Jonah's teaching, and now a greater one than Jonah's here. And you telling me that you ain't going to repent at my preaching? We have the Word of God. We got the New Testament. We see the grace and the mercy of God throughout, dripping off the pages. Oh, we are to be quick to repent. We are to love the opportunity, the privilege of being able to repent of our sins. 
Joel chapter 2, verse 12. The prophet Joel says, This is why the Lord says, Turn to me now. Say the time is now. When is the time to turn? Right now. Right now. Turn to me now while there is time. There's another scripture that says, God says, you know, there was times when you didn't know better before. I winked at some of your stuff, but I ain't winking no more. If God is saying the time is now, I believe that the time is now. I'm just that simple. He said, turn to me now while there is time. Give your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. Don't tear your clothes in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God. For he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. See, maybe you're running from God for this reason or that because you're scared of a harsh punishment. Let me just explain something to you. The punishment is built into sin. The wages of sin is death. The punishment is already there. God doesn't have to sit up there and dole it out to you. In fact, He's eager to relent and not punish. Your chances of not suffering the consequences of your sin is to go to Him. Does that make sense? We're scared to go to Him because He's going to punish us like He didn't know it happened. He knew it happened, and he knows what's about to happen if you don't repent. David repented. The prodigal came home. Things got better for him, didn't it? Peter jumped ship. He said, I'm not going down that road again. If God will give me another opportunity... I'm ju- I'll swim to him if I have to. And God turned it around. We'll close with this. We, we little Zacchaeus. You remember he climbed a tree so he could see Jesus? Now what's he doing up in a tree? This man is a traitor to his race. To the Israelites. He has made his living. Taking advantage of them and extorting money from them as a tax collector, working for the Romans. He's a traitor. What does he care about Jesus? If we little Zacchaeus can climb a tree to get a look at Jesus, then what should we do? Jesus looks and says, man, let me go over here. Zacchaeus, come on down because we're going to eat at your house today. See, Jesus says in Revelations, If I knock on your door and you open it, we'll dine together. And just as we encourage you to dine with one another through life groups, I'm encouraging you all the more to dine with Jesus. If he's knocking on your heart today, open up. Open up and let him in. Zacchaeus, being in the presence of God, he says, I'm giving half my wealth to the poor. And if I cheated anybody on their taxes, and we know he did, I'm going to give them back four times as much. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house today. Salvation has come to this house today. Do you need salvation in your house? I'm not just talking about an assurance of heaven, but I'm talking about do you need Jesus involved in your situation? When God whispers in his still, small voice, will you be close enough to hear him? When he says, this is the way, walk in it. Will you be way over here 20 miles off track saying, what'd you say, God? I'm just going to go this way. 
when He gives you course correction, when He gives you direction, when He whispers encouragement into your ear, when He says, you're my child, I love you, get back up, get in the fight, nothing can separate you from my love, the things that we need to hear that's going to excite our relationship with Him again to make our lives worth living, are you close enough to hear those things that He wants to whisper to you? Because I'm telling you, if you will turn it around, He will turn you around.